It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. Welcome in the summer of 1983 to another edition of Reflections in Time. This is a time when I try to visit and have over the period of the last few years with a great variety of our alumni in terms of staff and faculty at the university, some who are still with it, on the staff currently. And I'd, today it's a special pleasure to be sitting out in the nice yard at 830 Beverly Drive in that summer of 83, which I mentioned, visiting with Francis Hurst who was a colleague of mine for many, many years at UNO and who, within the recent past, retired. And I want Fran to visit with us about life as it was when he came to the university and a few other things. Fran, I've known you for probably a good part of 30 years. Yes. But I don't think I ever asked you, with that kind of drawl you have, where you came from. Before you ever came, where did you grow up as a little boy? I grew up in Anderson, South Carolina. I would have thought so. <laughs> and went to Clemson College. Uh... I uh, served in the service, got a commission before uh, I graduated and went into the service and we went all over the country uh, in the service and um, the way I got to Omaha was peculiar. Yeah, I wondered about how you, South Carolina boy and Clemson graduate, and all how you ended up here in the middle of America. Well. We, I went to command and general staff school down at Leavenworth, and my uh, wife had a uh, brother who lived here, and we ca came up on a couple of weekends, and we liked Omaha. We stayed at the athletic club, and that was a lovely place. Right, in downtown Omaha, beautiful place. Yes, and um, after uh, the war was over, uh, we were on our way to California to see some friends that we had been with for five years. Everywhere we went, they went. And we stopped in Omaha to see uh, uh, her brother, who at that time lived out in Papillion. And uh, they gave a tea for us, and they had uh, three or four members of the school board there. By now you had a degree. From I had a degree. You out of service. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'd gone back to Clemson and gotten my degree in education. So um, we were talking, and <clears throat> they said, well, what are you going to do uh, after you come back from California? And I said, well, I've got a job in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, teaching school. And um, it well, kind of dropped. And uh, a little while later, one of them came by and said, would you be interested in teaching in Nebraska? And I kind of laughed, and I said, yeah, if you pay me enough. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they said, well, what would it really take for you to stay in Nebraska? Well, I added $600 to what they were going to pay me in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. They were only going to pay me $2,400 a year. <laughs> so I said, $200 a month. Yeah, th I said, uh, $3,000. I said, that's about what they're going to pay me in Charlotte. And uh, they said, well, we're going to have a school board meeting tomorrow. So um, we'll get in touch with him. Well, gosh, I never expected to hear from him. The next day, the phone rang in the evening and said, could you come down and sign a contract? <laughs> and I looked at my wife, and she looked at me, and she said, it's up to you. And I, <clears throat> I said, well, we like Omaha, and we're close enough. So um, I went down and signed a contract. That was really a crossroads in your life. To it really was. North, really, from the, all your roots yeah. in the south. And um, then I uh, came into uh, UNO and uh, met Bill Thompson. 
uh, who was then the dean of the Arts College, and told him I wanted to work on a master's degree. What and, year uh, was this then? Uh, that was in 1946-47. And you were living, or at least teaching, then and on the faculty. I no, I hadn't started. Oh, you were this before you ever started? That was. I was ah. They wanted me to get a master's degree, I see. see. So I started on that, and um, Bill Thompson uh, said, well, why don't you go into psychology? You know him, he's always promoting yeah. psychology. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, I don't know. I said, i got to get this master's degree first. So I went to work on that and uh, ended up uh, getting a master's degree in educational psychology rather than in education. There was another influence of Bill Influence Thompson. of Bill Thompson, <laughs> yes, and Frances Edwards. Yes. Uh, she was quite a help to me. And uh, I stayed out in Papillion for two years. What and, sorts uh, of things did you teach out in Papillion? I taught chemistry, physics, <laughs> biology, and shop. Now, this was a pretty small school in those days, wasn't it? Right. How big was it, you recall? Oh, I think we had uh, about 135 in high school. It was just a little country town, really, it, wasn't it? Oh, well, I think they had uh, around 750 people at that time. Yeah. yeah. And today, I guess, it's 10,000 yes, or more. Yeah. But uh, it was a good experience for me. Um, teaching there and learning. Uh, really, you had some of your first experience really in teaching there, didn't Yeah, you? that was my first uh, teaching. Conducting the class. Except uh, when I taught at Clemson, I taught a year there. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, it was really uh, a nice experience out there. And I enjoyed it. And if it had the school system, when we came back to Omaha after we left and went to Indiana to work on a doctorate, I would have moved back to Papillion, but they didn't have the school system that they have now. You know, Fran, you're talking about the beginnings of your life as a teacher, where you spent most of your active, life. productive life. Uh, do you recall, uh, is there any special reason why you ended up in teaching, or did, you, did it just sort of happen? Would you, did you want to do something else, or did you always want to be a teacher? What was Well, I was in cons construction work with... Uh, the Bell Telephone Company, Southern Bell Telephone Company, and uh, they said, well, I got wounded during the war, and they said, you can't pass the physical exam to continue in construction. Why don't you go back to school and uh, get an education? So the physical hurt from the war it really changed your yeah, life Yeah, change, it changed. I'd have stayed with Bell Telephone in construction, but uh, they said, uh, you can't pick up that stuff. Hmm. And, uh, so... Uh, that's why I went back and uh, got my degree in uh, education. You know, along the way, we must remember the other half of your life, and that's your wife. Where did you, where did you meet uh, your good wife and become married? And it's, uh, in my relationship with you, you've <laughs> always been married, but there was yeah. a time when you weren't. Yeah, uh, I met I met her in the service. She was a lieutenant a nurse in the uh, army. Did she outrank you? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were the same to begin with. <laughs> Uh, second lieutenant, and I met at Camp Cross, South Carolina. They sent her all the way from Illinois. Uh, she was um, at Oak Park in Chicago, and they sent a unit all the way from there to uh, Camp Cross, South Carolina, and I met her, and uh, we got married in 1942. I was in the hospital. Uh, I got a uh, hit in the eye with baseball, and they busted my nose a little bit, and they put me in the hospital down there for a few days and I met her and uh, I don't know we just got attracted and um, started uh, dating and then I was uh, transferred to Columbia South Carolina and that made it a little more intense uh, uh, so then we got together and decided well we better get married if we're going to so uh, we got married in 19 May 1942. So it's a good, as we record this, in 1983, you had a long and happy married life of a good part of 40 years. Yeah. You? In fact, this might be the 40th year. 41st year. 41st year. Yeah. Well, now, you came to Omaha, the happen chance of the broken nose and the service uh, uh, injury, and one way or another you got married and you ended up in Omaha, now you've got a been working on a master's degree, and you're out of Papillion. Yeah. And Bill Thompson's still influencing your life, though, because right. you had an educational psych 
master's emphasis. Uh, now, what's next on the docket? Well, uh, I left Papillion because they wouldn't pay me uh, any more money, and Bill Thompson said, I'll give you a job. <laughs> so uh, I started working for the uh, uh, Child Study Service, which was the testing program for the Omaha Public Schools. Yeah, I wish you'd tell a little more about that, because uh, Bill Thompson, Francis Edwards, who you mentioned, yeah. was so heavily involved in that, uh, in leadership. Well, just what did they do? What sorts of things did you do in that testing service over it, the years? It was a uh, citywide testing program, actually. We tested all the kids uh, that had problems in the Omaha Public Schools. We tested all the uh, kindergarten kids before they uh, were able to go to school. You mean all of the all of the all, all No, not uh, those who were not... Uh, Five by uh, October 15th, uh, we tested those uh, to see if they uh, could pass a test to uh, go to school. What sorts of tests did you give them? Well, we uh, gave them primarily intelligence tests. That's what the state uh, required, So, um, and they had to have a, a certain percentile. They had to score at the... Um, well, at that time, they had to score at least 120 on intelligence tests to go to uh, kindergarten before they were five years old. So that was pretty uh, high, and um, over 50% of them didn't uh, meet the requirements. So they had to wait then another they year? They had to wait another year till they matured. Now, now, that was a private service, private no. group, having a contract with OPS. Was that the way this worked? Uh, no. Uh, Miss Edwards worked for the uh, Omaha Public Schools. Ah. Then Bill Thompson was the director of the through uh, the university and the university offered the facilities and so forth uh, as a uh, part of a um, service to the Omaha Public Schools so because really a university project then. yeah uh, because the school board uh, at that time uh, elected uh, the uh, president of the uh, university see they uh, uh, still at that time, you know, the school board really was the same for OPS and for the university. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they elected uh, the school board for OPS, elected the regents right. for Omaha University. So, they so it was not in politics. So it was really a... Uh, they were very close. Very uh, close and yeah. heavily involved with our university in yeah. those earlier years. Mm -hmm. Well, now, what year are we talking about when you got into that testing service? Uh, that was in 1946. 1946, seven. right yeah. around the wind-up of World War II, really, pretty yeah. much. And then uh, at the end of that year, um, Bill Tom uh, Dean Thompson offered me a job uh, teaching uh, introductory psychology. So I took that, and that was in 47, uh, 48, that we... Uh, I started teaching as an instructor uh, at UNO. Basic beginning 101 psych, as we've called it over the years. Right. Now, this was a new experience for you, too. This is the first teaching in psychology that you did. That's right, and uh, on the college level, too. But you had your master's in educational psychology, psychology so you no. felt reasonably equipped to get going. But no. Bill Thompson really was a an influential guy in your life. He certainly it? was. Uh, hadn't been for him, uh, I probably would have stayed in Papillion and taught school the rest of my life. Yeah, you... But he was quite a motivating factor. You really enjoyed the public school work then, too. Yes, I enjoyed uh, public school, but I enjoyed college much more. But you found, really got into teaching, friend, because... Uh, you weren't healthy enough because of your service action to yeah. do the work that you had done before. That, that's right. Finishing the way little things in life become so big over the years and really make for a change in direction. I never had any idea of teaching whenever I uh, uh, got my degree in education. I had other things in mind, but uh, whenever they offered me the job, I just took it. and. Uh, I'm, I don't regret uh, having done it. Mm -hmm. Now, this goes back, and it's kind of a tough one to answer sometimes, Brent, but can you remember when you came to Omaha, and more specifically, when you... Let's take the city first that you've lived in for a large part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, what was Omaha like when you came here in the, 
in the 40s? Uh, it was a big town. It wasn't a city. It was just an, a large uh, Midwest town. Uh, there was nothing uh, except Kenny's west of 72nd Street, where Brandeis and all of that is now is uh, was cornfields. And this lovely backyard where we're sitting at your home on Beverly Drive, uh, this was certainly a cornfield or something, wasn't it? Well... Or almost, <laughs> because you were really out of town here, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Well, there were cornfields uh, over on 78th Street there, the, uh -huh. the next uh, street over. There were no houses uh, there. Um, there was one school, uh, 66 had just started, oh, yeah. Loveland School up here. And uh, the high school was Underwood down on uh, Underwood. Yes. And, that uh, used to be the headquarters headquarter. in the years. Yeah. So uh, there wasn't uh, a Westside High School didn't uh, become into existence for several years after that. Well, we've come just about, Fran, to the end of our first little segment together for those that are recollecting with us. And we've done just about 15 minutes, so we'll take a little break here. And All we'll right. be back in just a moment with more of the life and times of, and reflections of Francis Hurst. Boy, we're sitting in the lovely shade of the backyard of Fran Hurst's home in the summer of 1983, and we come to tape number two in the sequence we're recording with Francis Hurst. Professor Emeritus from UNO. Well, Fran, let's pick it up. Uh, I, we've talked about Papillion and we've talked about your early life, meeting your wife, and now you're here at the university, and as you mentioned a while ago on tape number one, uh, really, the guy who had so much to do with your life, Bill Thompson, gave you a job. And you began teaching with your masters that you had then in educational psych, you began teaching at uh, UNO, which, what was, of course, Omaha University in those years. That's right. Who was, uh, who was the president of the university when you first started to work? Uh, Dr. Haynes was the uh, president, and Charlie Hoff was the treasurer at that time. Do you have any vague remembrance, at least, of uh, Professor Haynes? There are a few people that we can visit with on these tapes who really knew him, and you knew of him, at least. You knew him a little bit. Any, anything you can remember about that gentleman? He was uh, one of the most uh, easygoing people in the world. Uh, when I look back and look at Haynes, and then look, there's much difference between Haynes and Dr. Bell as it was a day and night. <laughs> uh, uh, President Haynes let Charlie Hoff run the institution. Charlie Hoff was the power behind the throne at that time. Uh, and where money was concerned, he had his hand on every penny of the university. And the and pennies at those times were kind of scarce, weren't yes, they? Yes, they were. Do you recall when you were a student here, Fran, uh, uh, remembering student days, let's jump back right. there just for a little bit, right. what the university was like then. It was a pretty small place, wasn't it, yes. in the mid-40s there? Yeah, it was real small. And I remember whenever we went out to uh, try to get the public to increase the uh, mill levy to two mills. Uh, that we were getting one mill, and uh, we and finally we got increased to two mills. What year was that uh, in? Do you remember? Oh, that was probably 48, 49, somewhere along there. That was now. the last change, in effect, yeah. for a long time. Wasn't it was, it? yeah. But the student body was involved, but it was small. Yeah. How many? A couple of thousand? How big was oh, it? Oh, no. Not even uh, that big, was no. it? No. Uh -uh. I think, uh, oh. We had one building. Yeah, the administration right. building. That was the only building there. The field house wasn't even completed. But wasn't it at the time you were there a very nice new building? Oh, it was the only air-conditioned uh, university in the Midwest. But everything took place in that one building. Uh, I have to give the administration credit. The uh, maintenance of that building was uh, magnificent. And they kept it uh, as clean as a pen. It was a pleasure to uh, be in that uh, building, the old administration building. Do you remember, as long as we're back in student days now, not faculty days, and any of the faculty? Their faculty must have been rather small at that time. With they a small were. Body. Yeah. Anyone who stands out in your memory among your teachers? Uh, I had Dr. Taylor. Uh, 
for uh, class in uh, psychology. And later on, I had him as my first office mate at the university when I started teaching. And I learned more from uh, him about teaching and about people uh, than anyone else. I uh, learned more about uh, advanced uh, psychology from Bill Thompson, but the basic stuff of teaching I learned from L.O. Taylor. Who was your Leslie roommate. Taylor, who was who was my roommate, and, and at one time your teacher. Yeah. Anyone else, uh, athletically or academically, that stands out in those years as a student? Uh, you had football and basketball. And oh track and yeah. Games, uh, well, I guess uh, Bert Jelkin, who was the uh, athletic director back then, uh, I was on. Uh, interested in sports and went over and talked with them and uh, I remember the uh, trip that they took down to the Tangerine Bowl now and uh, got kicked out of the uh, NC2A for it. That was back yeah. in the mid-50s when we yeah. were all part of the yeah. faculty. Well, let's move back to faculty days then. When you first started to teach then, that beginning psych course, uh, the university still was housed pretty much in that one building. It was still. Uh, we had the classes in the auditorium uh, of the administration building. Can you remember all the things that room was used for? Well, at one time it was a gymnasium. It, uh, actually, to play basketball in there at one time. Uh, they used as the uh, drama uh, classes, uh, plays. Uh, it was used for a little bit of everything in all the meetings. Must have been a tremendous logistical problem to use that place and to find time to use it to just schedule it. Oh, it was. Uh, everything happened in the auditorium. So I should imagine as close and small as the university was, there was a spirit that you can lose when the place gets bigger. People knew oh, each other yeah. and they worked oh, together a lot. I knew everybody by name at the uh, university. I could call everybody, to, you know, even the uh, janitors, uh, or custodians as they call them now, uh, by name. There was a nice closeness there that when things grow, it kind of drifts away, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and um, Bill Thompson always had a, a T for the uh, arts and science faculty and I had the job of introducing everybody as they came in and uh, meeting them because I knew all of them. And uh, I always enjoyed that uh, very much. And uh, he was a good host. Now, when you began teaching, uh, you had your master's degree, but then after you worked for a while, uh, you left again for a while, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, in 1951, uh, Bill Thompson said, you've been here long enough now. You go on and get a Ph.D. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, I don't need a Ph.D. He said, if you're going to stay in college teaching, you got to have a Ph.D. And I said, well, uh, I don't know if I'm smart enough to get a Ph.D. <laughs> and he said, oh, heck, you'll get one. So uh, I uh, went and... Uh, had an interview at Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. They offered me as an assistantship. Uh, I uh, had an assistantship uh, offered to me at University of Buffalo. And on the way back, I stopped in Indiana to see a friend of mine and stopped at Indiana University. And they at offered, yeah, at Bloomington, uh -huh. Indiana. And they offered me assistantship, so I ended up taking the one at uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Now, this is assistantship. Is this is 1951. Yes. And they gave me more money than I was making at UNO. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the figure that they $3,600. Now, that was to go to school on your doctoral program and to teach and what? to teach uh, uh, yeah mm -hmm. I taught educational psychology so then you and your family moved there in Bloomington Blo uh, Bloomington Indiana how many years did you stay there in uh, three by three and a half years and then uh, when I got my degree uh, Bill Thompson called me and said will you come back to Indiana I mean would I come back to Omaha University mm -hmm. And I said, uh, well, yeah, what do you pay me? And he told me and uh, when I, uh, and that I could do some research. But when I got back here, uh, I was 
talked to Dr. Bell, and Dr. Bell says, uh, this is a teaching institution. This is not a research institution. You are here to teach. So that uh, knocked out all the money that uh, was supposed to be for research. So uh, I taught anywhere from uh, 15 hours to 24 hours. Say that again, because in today's world, that's just unheard of. I taught uh, from 15 hours, one semester, I taught 24 hours. Yeah, now and now. I had four night classes. So you were teaching Monday through Thursday, right? Monday through Friday. Is, but I mean in the evening. In the evening, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about a heavy load there, but that was not unusual. Your colleagues in all the departments well, were teaching Well, they would teach 15, 12, 18 hours, yeah. Right, what was a normal, average, no load. overload, as we say? Uh, 15 hours was the average load and three hours overload. What sorts of money were they paying you in those days? Uh, I got $180 for teaching one cl uh, an overload. And your salary was about what, do you recall? Oh, 4800 to 5000 But in that day and age, that was not a bad salary. No. So things were improving a little bit, weren't they? Yeah. Now, in those years, when you came back, I imagine you noticed quite a change here. One of them you mentioned because Bale said, hey, this is a teaching institution. Yeah. Dr. Haynes had retired, that sort of thing, and uh, things were starting to change a little bit at the university. Were you noticing anything in the way of change? We were growing, of course, weren't we? Oh, yeah. We started to grow, and uh, uh, the GI um, Bill and uh, Bootstrap program started, and uh, we began to get all kinds of... Uh, of uh, people from the military. And uh, this bootstrap program um, started in the 50s. And when I came back in 54, uh, uh, we started a uh, <coughs> bootstrap club, a kind of a social club, to uh, help the uh, m military get established and uh, find a place to live because they were coming in here for six months and then finally they let them stay for a whole year. That club was called, and still is. Well, later on now. Oh, it wasn't a penny it? sword at that I time. Was a oh. Yeah, oh. it was a bootstrap club at, at, in the beginning. And it wasn't until 1957 that uh, we... Well, should I go into uh, why we uh, changed it from a bootstrap club to a pen and sword? Oh, yes, because I think the bootstrap <laughs> program was a very important program yeah, on our campus. It was. Well, in the beginning, you know, uh, military, they like to have their uh, social hours and this type of thing. Yeah. And um, with the money uh, controlled by the uh, treasurer's office uh, under student affairs, we could spend no money for any uh, social uh, hours or anything like that. So the military said, well, hey, why don't we make it a service club, and then we can take the money and put it into any uh, bank we want to, and then we can spend it the way we want to spend it. So I said, well, that sounds good. So we started to work on a uh, constitution for, the, uh, um, for a um, service organization, and finally, we came up with uh, a shield and with four stars and so forth. So we said the pen will represent the uh, academic aspects of it. The sword will uh, represent the military. And the shield will represent the Army uh, aspects of it. So we had the cavalry, the Air Force, and the Army all uh, involved in the uh, uh, pen for the uh, pen and sword. And that's the way uh, we became a service organization. The Penn and Sword is still in existence. Oh, yeah. In 1983, as we record this, they're still a very active yeah. group, aren't they? In uh -huh. fact, I think you still have some attachment to them. Yeah. I'm still an advisor. But you mentioned, and I think it's important that we do talk about that, the Penn and Sword and the Bootstrap Program, returning servicemen, finishing their degrees here. That was a big program, wasn't it, Frank? Oh, uh, we had over 1,000 people in the pen and sword at one time. 1,000 military people, and they were all the way from sergeants to colonels, full colonels. Now, there was a time, wasn't there, Fran, when 
oh, this military-related program that we had at UNO or the University of Omaha was one of the only ones of its kind in the country. It was the first. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we gave uh, Tampa, South Tampa University permission to use the term pen and sword. They asked if they could, and we gave them permission to uh, use it, and uh, they did. And they were the second uh, one to uh, go big for military. Now, um, Maryland had a bootstrap program overseas. They didn't have it on their campus at that time. Uh, so uh, people uh, confused the two a little bit. But okay. we were the first yeah. big uh, bootstrap program um, in the United States. And that lasted really in size and important to the university for a long, long time. Well, I would say until oh, in the 70s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, a person you mentioned a while ago in the I don't know if it was on the first or the second tape, and the big influence he had financially was Charlie Hawk. Yes. And many people, of course, who would watch this tape in years to come have no remembrance of Charlie Hawk. But he was a driving, dynamic, leader-type person under Dr. Bale. Yes. And previously, that's uh, Dr. Haynes. And, I mean, in many ways, he ran this place. He what ran. were your impressions of him as a person and, and as a how he handled things at UNO? Uh, I think he had uh, UNO, he lived and breathed uh, Omaha University because that was his life. Uh, he he was there all the time. He came in the morning and stayed until the evenings. Uh, he was dedicated uh, to the uh, university. I remember um, a little thing that happened that I thought it was uh, kind of played out of proportion, but uh, Charles Peebler and uh, Alan Beer, who was then uh, working with a little uh, publicity with uh, Brandeis, he's now president, mm -hmm. uh, chairman of the board, uh, but at that time they were just uh, working uh, individuals, came to me and said, uh, could we uh, have a little research study in psychology to see what type of personalities would uh, answer a uh, call, uh, make a phone call, if given a half, uh, half of a dollar uh, to uh, see what was going on. Or a ripped half dollar. Yeah, right. A dollar bill. Tore in yeah. half. Yeah. Uh, and I said, yes. Yeah. So we gave a um, um, personality test to the class. And uh, then they uh, gave their pitch and said, anybody that calls this number will be given a five dollar bill plus the other half of the one dollar bill so uh, I said all right so what they did they stamped the uh, one dollar bill with uh, Omaha University uh, stamp and tore it so that they could match it together to make sure they got the right ones you uh, know uh, so nobody would bring in five or six and <laughs> say uh, uh, we want this and this and this. So we passed out so many uh, in a uh, class who decided to participate in it. And Charlie Hoff hit the ceiling because we had used a UNO stamp. Or the University and, of Omaha stamp. Yeah, Omaha University. Anyway, he said we were <laughs> defacing uh, United States currency, so he called the FBI to come out and investigate <laughs> the... Uh, uh, desecration of uh, UNO of uh, uh, Treasury uh, uh, one dollar bills. So uh, uh, that was funny. What, what was the upshot <laughs> of it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, <laughs> FBI came out and he talked to me and he said, "Forget it." He said the banks do this all the time. <laughs> so, but uh, Charlie, he was really upset because they. Uh, use this uh, UNO stamp. But oh, in those early years, when he was the business manager and the vice president, I guess, yeah. of the university, finances were really a problem. Oh, they? yes. The middle of it, as you mentioned, things like that. But you had a closeness. You had a, you knew the people. We had a lot of spirit, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, people in the business office were wonderful. Velma Titzel, she was just a doll, and she worked in the uh, uh, business office for years and years, yes. and she's now retired. And uh, she was uh, kind of Charlie's uh, right-hand uh, man, so to speak, in the business office. Had Harold uh, Kefauver begun Harold Kefauver started uh, there, and uh, uh, 
uh, Leroy Cozeny started yeah. there, and he is now uh, a comptroller down at uh, Creighton. Uh -huh. So we had a lot of people who started, at, uh, you know, who've gone on to uh, do a lot of things. Yes, and some of those people you mentioned had a tremendous impact on the course the university took eventually, yes. didn't they? Uh -huh. Well, interesting. We're going to probably drop back to Charlie Huff from time to time because he seems to be a very interesting person. Yes. Now, we've come, Fran, to about the end of our second segment here in this Reflections in Time, and so we'll take another pause now here in the summer of 1983 as we're visiting with Francis Hurst. Well, we continue our visit in the backyard of the Hurst home at on Beverly Drive here in Omaha in the summer of 1983. And Fran Hurst and myself have been visiting about a great variety of things in the background of the university and the Hurst family. I think uh, now, Fran, we ought to talk about something that is really close to you along with your family, and that's your life in the psychology department, where you were engineered, really, to getting there <laughs> by uh, uh, Doc Thompson. Yeah. But you came back from uh, your doctoral Indiana. program. And... Uh, Bale was the president, and he emphasized to you this was a teaching institution, not a research institution. Right. Let's pick it up from there. It became a very strong teaching institution it in did. those years, didn't it? Yes. And talk about the department that you were a part of and how it changed and grew. Student body, pretty small, small classes, things yeah. like that? Well, uh, in the beginning we had uh, some small classes, but then it started to grow. And I was the only one in psychology besides Bill Thompson and then Frances Edwards. She taught a couple of classes in the summertime. So the department <coughs> meetings included two people. Two really. people. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I did most of the work <coughs> whenever we had a uh, department meeting <laughs> uh -huh. because uh, Bill had uh, a thousand and one things uh, he was doing at that time. But... Uh, when I uh, started uh, teaching, um, we were, all the faculty were arguing about uh, how many we should have, and uh, President Bale came in and said, if you can teach one, you can teach a hundred. If you can't teach one, you can't teach any. So we will have large classes. So we started having very large classes. I taught as high as 324 and as high as 500 in the auditorium. I was say, in those early days when you had that, that was down in the auditorium in the main building. That was the it. beginning, yeah. Oh. And then they built the engineering building right. over there. Yeah, the campus started to change now. The next thing yeah. was the engineering building. Right? Yeah. And uh, they had the auditorium there, and that would hold 324 people. And I had that full every semester. And I taught introductory psychology every semester, sometimes two times, did and you, we filled up the auditorium. Did you agree with Dr. Bale after you'd done that with a few, year, a few years that you could just easily teach 300 as you could one or whatever? Uh, no, I never did quite <laughs> come around to agreeing with him because if you had uh, 30 kids in a class, you could learn their names very, very quickly. Uh, once you get up to 50, you stop trying to learn their names. And whenever I had 300 in a class, 325, I never tried to learn their names. I would just, and at that time, we had to take roll because of the GI Bill. And if somebody came to uh, school uh, under the GI Bill and quit, the university was responsible for notifying them so they could stop paying. If it didn't, um, the rumor got out that the instructor was going to be responsible for reimbursing the government for the uh, <laughs> GI Bill of those people. That was no more than a rumor, was <laughs> well, it? Well, uh, they, uh, they pushed pretty hard uh, to the university to keep uh, check, and uh, we continued to uh, uh, take role for many years. Were we uh, having these big classes because, like Bale suggests we do it, because of lack of faculty or because the student body was really growing a lot for the basic course, or what was it? Well, the student body was growing, and we didn't have the money to hire more faculty either. So you were still a very small faculty. Yeah. When did it start to expand, the number of people that did the teaching in psychology? Uh, well, I'd say about 1960 it began to expand, and uh, we um, hired our first uh, person, uh, Bill James, uh -huh. was hired to come into the psychology department, and uh, he taught, uh, see, Dr. Garlow, who was in biology many years ago, he, 
he taught statistics mm -hmm. uh, for everybody, for the whole university as far as that was concerned. And they called it biometrics rather than statistics. So when Bill James came in the 60s, uh, he took over the teaching of um, uh, statistics. And uh, uh, there was another Thompson there, Claude Thompson, uh, many, many years ago, uh, who ran uh, the industrial psychology lab, so to speak. So. Uh, he got into uh, some problems and left and went down to Florida. Uh, then Bill James took over the industrial uh, uh, lab and uh, did all the industrial testing and uh, that type of thing, and he taught statistics and uh, industrial psychology. And didn't the man who is now our dean in 1983 come about that time too? Well, he came about three, four years later. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack Newton. Jack Newton, and then uh, he became, when Bill James left, he became head of the uh, psychology department. There was a discussion between uh, whether uh, I would take it or he would take it, and I didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So I said, I told uh, Dean Harper, uh, give it to Jack Newton. He's a uh, better administrative stuff. I'm much better uh, at doing other things. Uh, and then I was heavily involved with the athletic department about that time. Ever regret that, not going the administrative way? No, I don't. And uh, I uh, enjoyed uh, my uh, role with the athletic department because I love sports. And you were heavily continue. involved with athletics, weren't you? Yeah. On the committee and things like that. What sort oh, of yeah. things did you do? Well, uh, I was uh, chairman of the athletic committee for many years, and also uh, whenever we went in the NAIA, I was faculty, faculty representative and was uh, chairman of the faculty um, uh, representatives for the NAIA. Wasn't there a time at this university, University of Omaha, when the athletic committee was a rather powerful committee? Yes, uh, they con control the uh, athletic uh, budget and uh, uh, had a say-so in uh, what the uh, athletics uh, would be. Now, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, your department grew and changed quite a bit. Yeah. The number of people majoring, I imagine, and the types of majors changed. We had uh, as many majors as anybody. Uh, in fact, the psychology department was the largest department in the arts college. Uh, it grew and grew and grew. And then uh, later on, uh, the thing that I liked about it, we had the master's degree. See, we were one of the few people who had a master's mm -hmm. degree. What sorts of jobs were young people who majored in psychology going to in those days, Fran? Oh, they were going into business, uh, into testing. Uh, then we started a school psychology program. And uh, when, after the uh, merger with the uh, university uh, system, uh, which I hated to see, in fact, I wasn't in favor of the merger at all because I didn't think uh, it would help the university uh, at all. Uh, and if we had held out a few more years when Senator uh, Carpenter wanted it to become a state institution, I think we probably could have gotten uh, a separate state institution for Omaha University. But uh, everybody, we started running short on money, and everybody panicked a little bit and uh, uh, begged the uh, university to take over Omaha University, and they did. And uh, I do not feel that the faculty has ever really benefited from the uh, merger with uh, the university system. Now, we benefited as far as some uh, buildings are concerned and that type of thing, but uh, the basic thing is faculty, and I don't think the faculty has really benefited. Uh, How about the student in today's world? Do you think he or she is a little better off because we're a bigger university, or could we have done just as well for him or her with the type of university we had? Uh, well, uh, as you grow, you can get better programs, uh, and you have more money in which to uh, work with. And I think uh, uh, getting a little larger doesn't necessarily make it better, but if you have the faculty that we had, uh, it does get better. 
Why would you say was the main reason we did merge? What do you think? Money. Money. Yeah. The that loss of the middle heavy vote. Yeah. Dr. Bale resigned in that general period, didn't there? were a number of changes going on, weren't there? Yeah. There were, uh, and then Dr. Bale uh, retired, and then um, Dr. Naylor t took over as the president, and then the uh, regents decided a couple of years later that we didn't have the money, we couldn't get the middle of it, so the best thing to do was to merge. So they went into the uh, merger. And you feel, as you say, that we shouldn't have done that? Uh, no, I think if we'd have held out a little longer that we could have become a state institution because there were some uh, senators from Omaha in favor of mm -hmm. becoming a state institution. Now, see, Dr. Bell was always in favor of uh, one central uh, board over the whole thing, and I think coordinating this is, board for yeah, the state, right? Right, and I think this is what brought about the merger as much as anything else. That's something we never really did get, did we? No, and still don't in 1983. Right. Now, um, <clears throat> rather than talking about programs, thing, let's get to people. In the many, many years you've been at the university, really, since a good part of 1946 to 1983, you've known thousands of people, students and oh, faculty yeah. and staff that have come and gone, some dead, many still alive, but many who made an impression on you and your work and your world. What are some of the names, along with Charlie Hoff, who you mentioned, <laughs> of, of people that stand out, that just come to mind? Let's brainstorm a little bit here about that. Uh, Brand, anybody that comes to mind first. Well, uh, I, as I said earlier, I think uh, Les Taylor, L.O. Taylor, uh, had about as much influence on me as uh, anyone. Now, Frances Edwards had a lot of influence on me, too, uh, because she taught me how to evaluate children and uh, a technique that she had that I thought was outstanding. Uh, she only had a master's degree, but... Uh, she had more knowledge than a lot of PhDs that I uh, knew in the American Psychological Association. And uh, she was outstanding as far as testing of kids uh, was concerned. So I learned a lot uh, from her. Now, over in the um, uh, College of Education, I took some courses over there. And uh, Dean Gorman uh, had quite a bit of uh, influence on me, too. Um, over in the uh, College of Education. Um, I tell you, uh, there's one person that had, I had more respect for and, uh, than anybody else, and that was um, the fellow who taught philosophy. You remember him. Payne? Wilfred Payne. Wilfred Payne. Oh, he had a memory uh, they just wouldn't quit. I used to go in and just sit in his classes uh, because I enjoyed him so much. Never a note, right? Never had any notes, and it all was from memory, and I uh, thought that was just fabulous. And I could never quite do that myself. Most people couldn't, I don't think. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, Wilfred Payne. And he was probably the dean of the faculty, so to speak, uh, and had a lot of influence on um, how we would dress. If we sat at the table that he said that, uh, we had to have on a coat. Uh, this was understood uh, whenever you sat at Wilford Payne's table. There were table. a lot of un unwritten rules, weren't Yes, there? they were uh, in this respect. Do you remember yeah. an organization that they referred to as men of gold. Yes, that I belong. I belong. wasn't there. Yeah, I belong to that. What was that group? <laughs> well, it was just a group that got together and uh, uh, discussed uh, philosophical uh, problems. And Payne was the guy that started that uh, uh, organization. Wasn't, and he a little, wasn't he a little fussy on? who he wanted to come oh, to Oh, yes. Months. If you got, uh, you had it made once you got invited to attend uh, one of those luncheons. What were the basis for his inviting you? What are some of the criteria that he might have had? Do you have any memory of what he chose people on? No, uh, and nobody ever asked him. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Just all of a sudden, uh, you were accepted. Uh-huh. And, uh... 
uh, I'll never forget uh, the time that I was uh, asked uh, by Wilford to uh, come. It was a total surprise to me because I wasn't in philosophy. I wasn't really interested in it. I was interested in psychology. And, uh, but Bill Thompson, he was really interested in philosophy, and uh, he went to a lot of these things, too. But uh, then you set it at uh, Wilford's table and, uh, uh, with the rest of the uh, group. But there was a lot of good discussion, and uh, you learned a lot uh, from uh, the association with those people. That was the main thing. Another uh, area that you were <coughs> concerned with, you made reference to it in one of our earlier tapes, was the athletic department and the coaches and the athletic directors yeah. and the people. Who are the standouts over on that side of extracurricular activities in your memory, Fran? Uh, you, you mean on the coaching coaches, staff or students comes to and uh, that were so forth? Great people. Uh, I think uh, probably, uh, you remember uh, a guy by the name of Jerry Allen yes. and uh, Jimmy Head Jones? Student. Had them both as students. Now, they were uh, outstanding individuals, uh, actually. And both are executives, uh, one with power company back east, and Jerry Allen's with uh, General, what? Motors. General Motors in uh, Detroit. Detroit now. Uh, in fact, I got Jimmy out of trouble uh, one time. Uh, somebody accused him of taking something uh, uh, from a test, and uh, Jimmy said, no, he didn't do it. So I had to go talk to uh, the head of the biology department to uh, get Jimmy back in class because somebody had accused him uh -huh. of something. and. Uh, uh, I talked with him and uh, he went on Bush, uh, Dr. Bush, and he went yeah. on. He played uh, pro ball for mm -hmm. a couple of years, and so did Jerry Allen. He played the Washington yes. Redskins, uh, yeah. but uh, they were really outstanding uh, Who would you say had the most impact on the direction athletics took? At the coaches, the athletic directors, people that come to mind? Uh, I would say the uh, coaches and the uh, athletic committee had, and Dr. Bale. Now, Dr. Bell liked sports, too. Uh, he had uh, quite an influence on it. But uh, the athletic director uh, was more interested in, at that time, was more interested in baseball than he was in uh, getting an overall program. And that's the thing that used to upset me when I was uh, chairman of the athletic committee. We just had to uh, fight tooth and nail to get a broader program. And he didn't want a broader program. He wanted to stick with the baseball, basketball, and football. And we thought they should. Uh, Ernie Gore, back then, was track coach. And, uh, boy, he didn't get anything uh, for help. All the people he'd get was what came right from Omaha. And uh, we thought uh, our track program should be uh, improved a little bit especially uh, after the completion of the field house in about uh, 47, 48, back in uh, those times. And we had one of the finest facilities in the Midwest at that time, that field house. We've got about a minute left, Fran. What's the most uh, satisfying thing about having been at the university all these years in your memory? The people that I met and you and... Uh, Paul Kennedy and uh, Jack Newton, and well, I could go on, on and on and on, on, yeah. Well, I appreciate your taking time in the summer of 83 to reminisce about your impressions of people and the university, which was such a big part of your life and ours as we look back through the years. Thank you, friend, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our guest this summer then has been, in 1983 again, has been Francis Hurst, Professor Emeritus here at University of Nebraska at Omaha.